Good afternoon. My name is Toby Chess. I'm from Los Angeles. I'll introduce you to uh, my cohorts over here. Um, Ron Riken. Ron is a shop owner, MSO, out of Portland, Oregon. Um, he has a number of shops up there. They're all on the certification programs. And then the other cohort over here, Danny Gutenberg. He is a executive director of the DEG. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And between the three of us, we have over 120 years of estimating experience. Just between these two. <laughs> Thanks. Well, he's the oldest one. Uh, we invite you to ask questions. Um, I do this a little bit different than a, a normal uh, estimating class where the guys stand up there and tell you sheets. But before we get started, a couple ground rules. Um, we don't talk times today. Don't ask us what we charge. Uh, we're not going to talk hours. We will talk units, hopefully. If, you, if it does come up and you start asking questions, we'll have to stop the conversation. Um, we're a pr pretty loose group. We're here to have fun. Think, should we show them the new ADS that's coming out? Sure. This is a, the latest in technology. Um, they're, it's going to be in, uh, put into uh, vehicles. Um, right now, you can see it, they've been using it on a motorcycle. This, they're dealing with heads-up display. Everybody know what heads-up display is? Well, they've got it down where it's going to be in a motorcycle helmet. Dieser zur Unfallverhütung konzipierte Nachrüstsatz für Motorräder wurde von TFK Engineering entwickelt. Die technischen Details sind vertraulich, aber wir zeigen Ihnen die wichtigsten Eigenschaften des Prototyps. Der integrierte Computer überwacht die Radumgebung mit Hilfe von Video und Datenübertragung. Das Programm sucht fortlaufend nach Risikofaktoren wie zum Beispiel Fahrzeuge und Fußgänger und analysiert tausende von potenziellen Gefahrensituationen. Es prüft an einer Kreuzung zum Beispiel, ob ein Autofahrer sie gesehen hat. Die ermittelten Risiken werden an einen außen am Fahrradhelm angebrachten Empfänger übertragen und der Fahrer sieht auf einem im Helm integrierten Display, wo und worin die Gefahr besteht. Das Auto fährt auf die Kreuzung zu, ohne dass der Fahrer prüft, ob sich ein Motorradfahrer nähert. Das Fahrrad erkennt dies als potenzielle Gefahr und warnt seinen Fahrer rechtzeitig. Wir können die Aufnahmen aus dem Helmsystem herunterladen und Ihnen genau zeigen, was der Fahrer gesehen hat. Dann mal los, Karl! So, Lady Dublin, this is stuff that you're going to have to be dealing with when you write a sheet. So, uh, pay close attention here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got you, didn't I? <laughs> All right. You had me for a second. <laughs> Are you ready for lean production? Um, Writing a quality estimate is part of the whole process. So we're, just look at, we're going to look at some things here. Um, we're going to come around. We're going to ask you some questions. If you don't know, you don't know, and that's quite all right. Um, so these gentlemen will be out in the audience. We, might add, we have a microphone, and we'll ask you some certain questions here. What's a waste of time? Sir, what's a waste of time? Give me a, what do you think it is, definition? Waste of time. Looking for parts. What about you? Man with a beard. I like your beard. Yeah. What, what do you think a waste? The definition of a waste of time. All right. A devotion of time to useless activity. How many of you estimators go out there? And let me ask you a question, sir. You write a sheet. You walk out there with a piece of paper and you write all the information down, yeah. and then when you go back to your computer and you write your estimate. Ladies and gentlemen, how many times do you write that estimate? Twice. Twice. 
what would be a better solution? There you go. Again, when you start to look at these things, uh, it is imperative that you start to look at how I can utilize my time much better. And if we can walk over to a car with our tablets or our computers and write it there, it makes a lot better. How many of you take it, before you start that estimate, pull out the OE data? Raise your hands. My question to you about that, if you got a, a dent about this size on the 2018 Camry, right on the left rear corner, would you write a, would you write a repair on that or replace? <coughs> Sir, what, what would you write? No, the one next to you. <laughs> <coughs> Roger. You'd write repair. Sure. Make more money. That's on the bumper. Yeah, why would you replace it? Hold on. Pardon me? Thank you. How would you have that information if you didn't know it? You better print it out because you go ahead and fix that vehicle and now you got a problem. And then the, the uh, blind spot monitor doesn't work and they got to take the bumper back off and it costs you a waste of time. The definition of justification. Sir, what do you think it is? Okay, I'll accept that. Anybody else? Justification? Yeah. What do you think is a justification? Definition. Say it again, please. A plausible reason to do that. Very close. Where do you get justification from? Your knowledge. Well, we're going to do, Danny and Ron and myself, we're going to give you knowledge. Uh, and the stuff we're going to give you, you're going to be able to take back to your shops next week and put it to use. Um, and I guarantee you when you see what, you, what we put together for you, you'll understand the knowledge that you're going to be able to go back with. Gross profit. Sir, what is gross profit? The cost of doing repairs. Pardon me? The cost of doing repairs. Sir, gross profit. I don't care. I'll just stick it in front of them. <laughs> uh, gross profit is your money left over after cost of goods, cost of labor, and expense. Very good. What else? A couple other things. So gross profit is calculated as sales minus all of those costs directly related to those sales. So, everybody understand that? So, would the rent be included in that? Yes or no? No. How about your salaries? No. So, it's just the things directly related to the sales. What makes up the sales in a body shop? Body and paint, parts, sublet, and materials. Question, what makes up the cost of sales? Those costs directly related to that sale. So the cost of labor, cost of parts, cost of materials, and cost of sublet. <coughs> Chime in anytime you want, gentlemen. We always use uh, just anything that either is used in the repair process or that leaves on the car after the repair. Uh, is it just a quick analogy that we've always used? So. How do you calculate gross profit percent? All right, write this down. Calculate it as follows. It's a very simple formula. Sale minus the cost of that sale divided by that sale equals gross profit percent. 
it's a formula you should commit. Because every time, anything that you do, you need to follow that to see where you are. What would a shop do to increase its gross profit? Chuck, give me a, what could it do? Become more efficient. Buy the formula. Oh. <laughs> Reduce cost. No, do the other one. Increase sales. Thank you, because I... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I can increase my sales. I can lower my costs. What's the third one? Adding to the business. What's the third one? Anybody? Come on, there's a third one. Oh, come on. Can't you see it? You do both. <laughs> so I, I can reduce my sales and, I mean, increase my sales and lower my costs. And guess what? It's going to change our GP. Actually, this was a body shop in Los Angeles a long time ago. Do you reckon we fix a body shop? The shop does 1,000 cars, 100 cars per month. The average RO is 2,000. Total sales for that month will be 200,000. The cost of labor, materials, sublet, and parts is 120,000. So let's plug that into our formula. So we have 200,000 minus 120 divided by 200 gives you a 40% GP. We all see that? We all good with that? Good. What would happen if we add $25 of materials to each sale that is not a use in the repair but not charged for? So what would be our new sale price? Anybody? How many cars are we doing? Hundred. In each car, we're adding twenty-five dollars. How much would be our new sale price? Two thousand five hundred. So our new sale price would be two hundred two five hundred. Cost stays the same because we now charge for those items. Correct? Everybody see that? What are we going to divide it by? The new sale price. I just changed your GP by adding twenty-five dollars in essence by 0.7. Some of you managers and owners, if I gave you that right now, how happy would you be? This, uh, uh, we need some response. What do you think? I mean, point, if I could, just showed you right now, you just increased your GP by 0.7% by just adding $25 of materials and things to your estimate. That you're already using. I'm sorry? That you're already using. So let's go a little bit farther. What happened when we had $50 of labor performed but was omitted from the estimate? How much is that now? We have 100 cars at $50. There you go. What's our cost? Now, I'm a lousy owner, so I'm going to keep all that money myself. Well, what be, what's our cost? 120 We just increased our GP by 42.2. But let's take, let's take the numbers and raw numbers. That's bottom line money, ladies and gentlemen. That would translate to approximately $96,000 $96, in gross profit per year. So when you start to look at these things and you say, oh, it's just $10 or it's just $5, doesn't work anymore. But Toby, you also have to consider uh, on the paint side, um, if it's two tenths or three tenths, and there's also a paint material calculator. So in the refinish department, this formula becomes extremely important because you're not only picking up additional labor that you're still performing, and there's a material calculator along with that labor. So uh, it happens very, very quickly. So profit comes, and, and that's the whole you know, content of what we're trying to present, profit comes in fractions of percentage points, but they add up. And that's, that's what we're trying to drive home to you guys, is yeah, that three-tenths is important, that two-tenths is important. Uh, you start at the front of the car and work your way back. Um, you know, if you think about a front bumper overhaul, um, in, in our state, a front license plate is required, but most bumpers don't come drilled for it. So to locate and drill for a front license plate, you can get anywhere from 
a one time unit to three, four, whatever the time unit is, uh, that, that equates to this profit margin. Um, aligning fog lights, that's a, a, a low hanging fruit that gets missed a lot uh, on a bumper. It's not included in the overhaul. So, you know, what we're going to do as we work through this is to give you real life practical examples of what you can take back to your stores and that you can implement. You're not going to eat the elephant all in one bite, but we're going to try to give you those tools to start getting that gray matter to start thinking and looking at that and seeing where those little profit percentages are. Because you can take a job, a $2,500 job, and it, it could bounce to $2,750 or, or upwards of $3,000, and that's going to that's gonna make a significant difference. So again, when you start to look at these things and you start to give this stuff away, uh, again, we're not, I'm not talking about DRP, non-DRP. I'm just saying is that when you start to look at these things, you know, look what it does to your bottom line and start to, be, start to recognize those things. What does it cost to write a supplement in a body shop? Give me some numbers, ladies and gentlemen. Come on. Do we have to go around to stick a mic in front of you? Bucks. Cost to write a supplement. Sir, what do you think? $100. 300 Over here. Not Roger. Come on, gentlemen. You're going to make me do this now. <laughs> All right, I'm down here now. Okay. What does it cost you to write a supplement? What do you do at your shop? Blueprint. What do you think it costs you to write a supplement to that? Hundred dollars, sir. What do you think? How about you? Okay. Well, you wouldn't know. Huh? So we had one hundred to five hundred. What is a supplement, ladies and gentlemen? Pardon me? No, it is not. You're pretty close. What did I tell you what we started off at the beginning of this thing? Waste. It's a waste of time. Every time you write that estimate, it's going to cost you this. $288. And that's 10 years ago. And trust me, the people that we sat down with this, that's what happened. So why do you want to write a supplement? So we have a number of people here that are blueprinters, correct? You're supposed to get everything. How many people are actually measuring your, your supplements? If you ever get a chance to read a book, it's called The Game of Work by Chuck Coonrand. You can find them on Amazon to use one. I would advise you all to go and read it. And what he does, he talks about everything we do in sports or in leisure and puts it to use in our business. Who plays golf around here? I didn't say well, I just said who plays golf? Stand up, sir. When did you play last? Uh, What'd you shoot? 82. Where? Uh, whole bunch of playgrounds. How many balls did you lose? Zero. Zero. Yeah. What was your best hole? My best hole was the first hole I birdied it. Really? You got a birdie. Yeah. What'd you shoot it? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you do at your shop? I'm an owner of a tax company. Owner. How many, how many comebacks did you have last month? Uh, three. You sure? Yeah. Positive. Yep. Very good. <laughs> It, it, he ruined my whole thing here. <laughs> I'm, you're, I'm going to pick on you the rest of the night. <laughs> no, most of the time when I play that little game with them, they know everything. Then they ask me how to come back. They go, oh. What does a comeback cost you? It could cost you thousands of dollars. So we want to eliminate it. A supplement is a waste of time. And you, as owners and managers, need to start to look at them and find out why you're writing a supplement. If you're not looking to see what the problem is, guess what? It's going to always perpetuate. 
my, back to this book, chapter 3, it says, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. The more that you sit there and put these things down, you can manage it. And if you looked at that, here's a gentleman who had three. Let me ask you back again. So what were the, what were the three comeback uh, for? Uh, window, regulator, the bolt one bolts were not, the uh, window wasn't in the right position for the one. It was going up slow at the very end. One was a customer saying that there was a scratch on the bumper we didn't repair, but we did. And then the other one that was a truck. How many, did you see which technicians worked on those cars? Yes. For the same one? Nope. Okay, good. How did you correct it? Do you have a checklist? We're working on it. You okay. Do you think a checklist would have helped you out? Definitely. Definitely. So you, as you can start to see, ladies and gentlemen, you know, these are things that you can start to do in your facilities. How many people have SOPs for everything in your shop? Do you have one for putting a car on a frame machine? No. How many of you have? A, how many of you have an SOP to put a car on a frame machine? Let me ask you this question: How many times do you put a car on a frame machine during the course of a month or two months' time? Goes up there, it's all secured down, and you didn't have all the parts. Raise your hands. Come on. Hey, we're amongst, we're all honest here. It happens, right? So what, is the, what do you think we would have if we wrote an SOP for a frame machine? What would be the first thing we would need? OK, what else? Pardon me? Putting a car on a frame machine. We already got to the teardown. Well, we got the frame machine. <laughs> What's the first thing we're going to do? We got parts. What else do we need? Pardon me? A repair plan? OEM specifications, an estimate. What else? Before we put the car on the frame machine. <laughs> good tech. I like that one. All right, we got the good tech. We need our tools. So what we want, would like to do is have everything ready there. We put the car on the frame machine. And outline every, every car is going to be different, but the procedures are all the same. And guess what? Your speed, your time that you spend on that frame machine will go down, the quality will go up. And this is not just me sputing crap out of the air. It works, ladies and gentlemen. So everything that you do in your facility should have an SOP. And we'll look at some that I put together here. What do we do in our body shops? What do we do? Sir, what do we do in our body shops? Repair cars. How many agree with them? Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Thank you. Raise your hand. Who doesn't agree with that? Come on. No, no, everybody doesn't agree with that? Ron, do you agree with that? No. No? How about you, Danny? I agree. You agree. I contend, let me ask you this, sir. You fix cars, right? Do you not give it the same warranty as an OE after it's been repaired for corrosion protection? Do you not give it the same warranty as the paint as it came on the original car? Say yes. Yes. <laughs> Do you not give it the same warranty for that the car is uh, dimensionally back to its original specifications? Yes. Do you not give it a warranty that it will behave in the same manner as a, if it's involved in another accident? Right. I contend, ladies and gentlemen, it is not repairing a car, we remanufacture it. This here is the Ford Motor Company in 1913. I took this picture for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty good for an old fart. Now, let's, let's talk about this picture real quick. Oops. We have over here parts. What would happen to the production line if those parts aren't there? It stops. What would happen, these two gentlemen, we have Mike and Sam, 
and all they do is put the transmission in there. And they don't show up because they had too much cervezas the night before. What would happen to production? It stops. Over here, this gentleman has a torque wrench and it broke. What would happen to production? If you can all agree with me that this is a remanufacturing process, let me ask you a question. How many would want to change their opinion and say that we manufacture these cars? Remanufacture. Raise your hand now. How many don't care? <laughs> then we will use the principles of manufacturing. Now, part of my background is I'm an ICAR instructor. And one of the things I did is I started the mobile welding program. I've done over 6,000 technicians the last 15 years. I was doing some modification in my little trailer, and I pull out a, I didn't even know it was there, I was moving one of the panels back, and I found the worksheet. The data was made, who did what, when they checked the lights, and the whole bit. You know, we need to do the same. We need to have records of all of this stuff as you go through this process. And if the gentleman over there had a checklist that he's going to put to get put to use, maybe those comebacks didn't cut. Maybe one, or, but he might have eliminated two of them. Okay, I'm going to build this house. What do I need? Blueprint. Would it be wise for us to sit there and only do this part of the blueprint and start building on it, then add another room and then add another room? Yet, what is the blueprint in, the, in our body shop? Roger, what is it? It's a repair plan. So why do we want to run a partial one? We want a complete one. So uh, I got my house. So I got my two by fours, I get my plywood, I get my hammer, I got my saw, I'm ready to go to work, right? Nails. Pardon me? Nails. nails? What do you need nails for? Oh, okay. There you are. There's your nails. Again, how many times we get started, we go back to the frame machine, we start on that car, put it on the frame machine, and then it sits because we didn't buy those parts. And now you got a dead piece of equipment. And then you go tell the guy, oh, go find another job to do. So now he starts working on another job. And this one sits. Again, think about what we're talking about. Those are the wrong nails for the hammer you're using. <laughs> <laughs> you're up, then. So we need to, we need to uh, uh, wake up and realize that we need to start using the systems that we have in place. It's, it's 2019. We're almost in 2020. And yet, we still see estimates written like this. Um, it's, it's a lack of utilizing the resources available. I mean, we have digital estimating programs. We have information to the OEM uh, uh, software. So one thing I encourage everyone to start doing is start using a estimating system, whether it be CCC, Mitchell, or Auditex. Can we all agree that's something that, as an industry, we all use, right? Additionally, we need to start using those programs correctly and start reading into the P pages and the not included operations, the included operations, and any additional factors, something that you may not capture, something like you know, writing it by hand and then referencing additional books. So what we do is, what I like to do is have a, when I'm writing a repair plan, I like to have multiple monitors in front of me. I like to have an estimate in one screen, I like to have the OEM information in the other screen, right next to each other. So I can go back and forth without having to open and close windows, and it's more efficient. We're talking about waste of time, opening and closing, all those seconds add up. So again, when you have your OEM repair procedures, you can start looking at different bulletins. And in this case, the Toyota has a crib bulletin, which outlines the, uh, the types of welds that are needed. If we know this is a required uh, welding operation that needs to be done on a vehicle, we can start documenting repair plans, and we may capture not included operations beyond that, such as referencing our P pages like welder setup, destructive test welding, because this vehicle may require Three different, three different types of welds to be done. When you start looking at repair information, yesterday I did a class um, just in the, you know, regarding owner's manuals. The owner's manuals 
are for the customers, which you can, you can show that this is the vehicle that they bought, they purchased. Our, our job as a repair is to remanufacture the car correctly. And using those owner's manuals in your repair manuals, they will state many different operations that you may need to do that's not factored um, in the repair process. That's, you would never even think. In a minor collision, you may have to do a required inspection. So in Nissan's, the electronic service manual, they clearly state in the collision, what types of uh, inspections to be done, whether an airbag is deployed or whether an airbag is not deployed. And believe it or not, when an airbag is not uh, deployed in a Nissan, you may have to go as far as taking a whole dash apart just to check something and put it back together. But beyond that, now that we've got the dash apart, we've got to put it back together. There's another process involved. Is there any kind of fasteners? Are there any kind of replacement parts that you have to <coughs> replace the, in that, in that uh, operation? So you can see, you can be chasing the owner's manuals or the repair manuals many pages. I believe a door handle on, uh, on a late model car had about 60 pages just to replace a door handle. Between disconnecting the battery, between the inspection required, between the replacement of all the, uh, the one-time use fasteners, the component, the seals, just to get to a door handle. And having that on the front end during your repair planning stage will alleviate you when it, uh, when it uh, will alleviate the headaches when you go to put the car back together over a 39 cent clip that you forgot to order, that you thought you had in your box, but it's a special clip. You know, Danny, there's another point too. Um, you know, just the procedure for disconnecting and reconnecting the battery. How many of you know that Nissan wants the steering wheel centered before you disconnect the battery? And what the reason, you know, for that is, you know, we've got a zero point calculation. Uh, on the on your alignment, so you know, they want you to center the steering wheel before you disconnect the, the battery. Uh, uh, it's a, you know these things are complex now, and going back to the to the, you know the referencing is just imperative at the beginning of the repair process. You need to capture these these operations, and the only way you can do that is, is by following the early repair procedures at the beginning of the repair plan process. How many people here are, are looking up repair procedures in their shops? How many people are using OEM repair procedures in their shops? How many people are using third party information? Okay. This is a wake up call. You need to start using the OEM information straight from the manufacturer and dates and that has a date stamp on there for that day. The third party information is a great resource and good, and good information uh, place to get the starting information. But sometimes they're not getting the up to date information that the uh, OEM pushed out the night before. It may come out two, three, four week, days later. And I'm not knocking any one company. Again, it's a great resource to start investigating that repair plan. But always use that OEM repair information. An example that I had, and this came from a DEG inquiry, was because of a uh, situation where the shop was replacing a rack and pinion on a, on a Toyota vehicle. They printed the procedure from the third party site, and it called out to uh, R&I the engine. So they went ahead, removed the engine, put the rack and pinion in, and realized, hey, this, this time wasn't enough to do this entire job. So they submitted an inquiry. We found out that, there was, that the engine never needed to be r and and that the time was actually correct to install the rack based on the new procedure, but because they referenced the incorrect procedure, they pulled the engine out for no reason. Is that something anyone wants to do? Or they replaced a component that the manufacturer no longer required to be replaced as a one-time use part and the shop ended up eating a $900 spoiler just because the third party information didn't, wasn't updated to reflect that a part could be reused. And some of these manufacturers are pushing this uh, information, updating it overnight, and there's no push notification to anyone saying, hey, you just saw this yesterday, we updated it today. Every day you work on that vehicle, you need to reference the latest information. Some of them will print you a VIN number specific to that repair order, or you have a, a, a date stamp and a time when you printed it. Keep that in your file, and when the, car, when the car leaves, you have that documented in your file. Honda did a deal in the 2014, um, their original repair procedures, and these are from the OE, that the D-ring, which would be the hinge pillar, rocker, upper surround, A pillar, that that, that was, there was a sectioning procedure in 2014 for that. In 2015, they changed that to a non-sectioning procedure. Now, if you have a body tech that happens to work on a lot of those cars and said, you know, for the last 14 of those, 
you know, I could section it here and section it there and I had success, but now the OE did additional crash testing during that time period and decided that, you know, we no longer want that D-ring section. Uh, if you didn't have that and that, that, that repair failed, you know, you could end up uh, in, a, in, in some serious litigation or something like that. So back to Danny's point, it's critically important that every time you do that repair, you pull the, the pr repair procedure. Even though if you've done it repetitively uh, for a lot, you know, on a lot of different vehicles, um, they, they do change it. And, and they don't inform you that they changed it. Correct. So. But going a little bit farther with the same scenario is that when they put the 1500 MPA rated reinforcement on the uh, Honda Accord, it said, what kind of welds? MIG rays and resistant spot welds. If you look at it today, they now allow some MIG welding in certain areas. So again, as Danny was and Ron were alluding to, ladies and gentlemen, you need to have current data. Something that you did a year ago isn't gonna work today. Perfect. So we spent all this time researching this information, and I know we all spend a lot of time researching, right? How many people agree it's a pain in the butt to get into the sites to begin with? Yes. How many people agree that it's a pain in the butt to find the information? Yes. It's a domino effect. There's links, there's sublinks, there's this, that. It's a spider web. You can get lost in the World Wide Web. Go to YouTube, you'll figure it out. So we've had inquiries come in through the DEG asking, if I'm replacing a bumper cover, does this time allow me to go in there and research all the information required in the manual to do that repair correctly? Well, that's a good question. As a repair, we should be knowing, how, we, we know how to fix cars. We need to reference it. Well, we submitted that uh, question to all three information providers, and they came back and they all acknowledged that the time to research and the cost associated with that is not included in their labor times. Can you repeat that? It is not in the labor time. So they went ahead and even defined it further beyond the DEG inquiry, they actually updated it in their P pages, and this is from CCC and Motors, they, act, they updated it. Access to repair information in subscription costs is not included. Great, we got that defined. Now what happens if you're a shop that owns the information system, the, the, the data, right? You have the information already prepaid for the year, it's part of your uh, OEM. They went ahead and again, on the bottom, repair information, retrieval and lookup is not included. Time to access all the EPCs, the electronic parts catalog, researching, internet ordering time. If you have to go and uh, order a special part from a third party vendor, all these things that are associated with that, that's not included in the labor time. Mitchell and Autotex have similar verbiage. They haven't updated it in their guides, but it's, it, we have DEG inquiries to support it. Hold on. Let me explain to you what this is. Uh, this here is a, if you, here's another thing to write down, scrs.com. This here is what we call our guide to repair planning. This is the Bible. Um, March Taylor, who was a shop owner in Hawaii, and I did this about 20 years ago. We put this together. Um, we gave it to SCRS, and they have expanded on it you will see this is free to you. If you go to the scrs.com, and there's over 1,000 non-included items in there, ladies and gentlemen. 1,000 non-included items. We now have, and it was just announced uh, two days ago, and Ron, you wanna talk about it? Yes, um, SCRS uh, has um, joined uh, forces with uh, Nugent. Nugent Technologies, if you clicked on a fender, all those add-on items that you put on the end of your estimate, for instance, uh, building uh, and you know, locating an emblem, a lot of people think that the, the time in the, in the database is, is to locate and put the emblem on. No, it's to pull the adhesive off the, the, the pre-mask and set that emblem. Well, how much time does it take to measure and locate where that nameplate goes on the fender? So how would you envision this? You click on replace fender, and there's a, there's a drop-down window that gives you uh, mask for texture coat, spray out to, match, to uh, match texture coat, and to apply texture coat to the, the fender liner, uh, retaining clips, uh, lining the headlight, um, 
you know, the things that are related to changing that fender, but you typically add those on. And when you add them on, they're usually in a different font, and in a lot of cases in the estimating system, they, they end up at the bottom of the estimate. And, you know, the third party payers typically will go to the back of that, the bottom of the estimate, and that's where the red line begins. So now this is going to be baked into the cake in the same font, in the same sequence, and this, this applies, and it took us about two years to, to go through the over a thousand items that are added on, and it's segmented into each operation, rear body panel, spot and burn trunk floor, uh, match uh, seam sealer to form and, and finish. The application is included, but matching the form and finish is not. So all of these things now are going to be aggregated into, into that system. And it will be launching uh, in the, within the next couple of weeks, probably. Mid-January mid is the release. It should be the launch date. So this tool will help you scrub the estimate, identify potentially missed opportunities, and allow the repairer to, or the sh whoever it is using the tool, to select the items they want to add in there. So I would suggest if you guys, you know, after this seminar uh, this week, uh, for the remainder of the week, come by the SCRS booth and check out this tool. I'll be demoing it with you guys. We do demonstrations between uh, 10 and 2. But come by anyway if you're uh, during a different time, and we'll still do a demo for you. Question: Something we've been asking the estimating systems to do for years that they've never catered to the body shops. What do you guys do? Again, you know, if you're not a member of SCRS, I if you use that right there, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the cost of membership is already paid for one time. This one scrub will pay off your membership and in you know the cost of the tool we're not we're not selling it right now but this is just what the tool can do again this one's free if you want it in a pdf form i would just encourage you to all come by the booth check it out and learn more about it but um, this one is a free tool the the one that you can print out is on the scrs website and it's a free tool you can print out and laminate and give it to all your techs and writers but what it does it allows you especially if you have multiple locations so that all of your repair planners and blueprinters are singing off the same page if you have a menu item for uh, four-wheel alignment or you have a, a menu item for uh, a dynamic road test or a calibration operation or something like that, uh, you know, maybe what you charge for a urethane windshield kit uh, or a high modular uh, kit for, uh, you know, one of the European model vehicles. You can, you can go in and populate your own, you know, you can personalize this and then share it across your platform. So all of your stores are, 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 are singing off the same sheet of music. We talk about fixing a car or remanufacturing a car. Who agrees fixing the car is the easy part these days? I do. Who agrees that there's many challenges before you even touch a car? Office work, right? There's administrative work, administrative labor. These are just commonly missed uh, things that we got to do when the car just enters our facilities. Taking photos, does that take time? Is washing a car that maybe a vehicle comes in a little dirty with some uh, road grime salt and the car comes in for a little scratch you got to wash car, the vehicle what if the car went off the road you know what if it's got dirt and debris and everything else underneath it and you're gonna you know, gonna have to try to analyze the suspension uh, or look at the you know inner rocker or uh, if it's an electric car is there damage to the battery on the underside uh, things of that nature you got the car clean now you got to take photos of it again showing that you did that wash and now you can see the damage, and now you're going to identify potentially any prior damage on the vehicle and current damage. Car comes in with leaking fluids. You're going to let that oil stain on your, on your drive? You're going to have someone to go out there and clean it, put some, uh, some sand down, some uh, dust down, get that cleaned up, and then what do you got to do with all that stuff? You think you can throw it away in the trash? For anyone in California, you're going to throw oil in the trash? Big what, fine. What if those fluids are leaking and they're heading towards the, the storm the, sewer? The drain. How about a car with a broken window or disabled uh, electrical systems? What are we doing? And we don't have space in the shop to put it in there. Wrapping it. Okay, now that we put crash wrap on the car, where did that crash wrap come from? It's free from Amazon, isn't it? <coughs> oh, the bubble package? Yeah, yeah the leftovers. Yeah, that's what I thought. How about a car that you gotta move around the lot that it can't be driven? How many, how many people are using forklifts? Or how many times you got six people just to move a car? What about the workman's comp claim for the back injury for the guys pushing it? Good point. So we haven't even started touching the car yet. Now we're going to hook up a, a scan tool to the vehicle. Car's dead. What are you going to read out of a dead car? 
So you're going to have to put a charger on the vehicle, put a battery stabilizer on there. I want to see if there's any damage to the structure. You got the hood open finally. See if there's any movement. Are you going to start measuring some, some uh, tram gauging, some uh, using a, like a, a, a camera system, of a, like a matrix wand? There's different tools out there, but we're, we're, we're just uh, diagnosing the vehicle structure. How about a vehicle that may come in with some uh, driving issue, it ran over a pothole? Are you going to see a, a three degree tilt in the camber and be able to identify what part is bent? So what are you going to do? Do a pre-alignment. Do you have an alignment shop or do you have an alignment rack in house? Are you going to send it out? How is it going to get there? I don't want to drive a car that's potentially damaged. So are you going to have to tow it there? Doing some disassembly, doing some repair planning. And then now we got all these parts off the car, we got the broken parts, what about the good parts that we're going to reuse? Are we just going to throw it in the back of the trunk? Are we going to protect it, wrap it, put it in a, in a, in a safe location? There's cost involved in doing all that kind of stuff with the materials and the labor. That's not factored into the labor time from the databases. You always remember that in the time in the database is for the technician to physically perform that operation on a new undamaged vehicle. And I reiterate, a new undamaged vehicle. So any additional air chisel work or anything else that's related to accessing the bolts that you need to on a damaged vehicle is not included in that time unit that, that is in that database. So, uh, you know, back to the point, all the time studies are done on new undamaged vehicles. We want to see, car went off road, we got to lift it up to see what's going on with the underside. We haven't, we're not working on the car, we're just diagnosing it, so we got to raise the car up. What kind of rack can we use? Are we going to use one that raises it by the belly, or are we going to use something like a two post? You know, so you got to use, uh, use the appropriate lifting equipment. So again, cleaning the vehicle. When we're inspecting a vehicle, I think we've all, we've all come across this. We see signs of previous repairs, right? What do we do? We document it. We call the next technician over. Hey, look at this crap. <laughs> right? And then you find out it was him that did that repair. <laughs> <laughs> or it could have been you. <laughs> so again, we're, we're going to uh, inspect for prior work done. Document it. More work that needs to be done, right? Now you got to call the customer. You got to call the bill payer. Hey, I can't work on this area because there's an uh, improper repair done. So, and then it starts leading to more and more issues. So now we're going to start looking up a repair information, logging in, finding the information. It's a domino effect. Now we're writing the repair plan. We got our P pages. Everyone know what the P pages are? Money. That's all the stuff that's not considered in the database from included to not included operations, which define it. And then again, diagnosing. Now you have a scan on the vehicle. You, you finally got the power, the, the system's powered up. You scan the vehicle. You got code P3218. What does that mean? We don't know. Well, a P code, right? <laughs> we got an SRS code, open, open sensor. Now you got to research it. You got to dig into it. You got to... You start looking into the buckles, you start looking into the pretensioners. So that's all time spent, we've got to look into a vehicle. Now we're walking around the car. We're, how many people get a car that's wrecked in the front end and go straight to the front end of a car? Where do you go? You should be looking around the vehicle, looking at the back, looking at the interior, did things, did things move around, did something shift in the trunk compartment, did something impact the, the rear package tray? Look at, look at uh, uh, wheel gaps between the, uh, the, the fender and the, the wheel, where it sits. Did things move? Anything can happen in a collision or in an accident. You know, it's very important if you have the, the, the vehicle owner that, that was involved in the accident. You, you know, this, is the, this is the time and this is the opportunity to, to have a discussion about that. Did you do a 360? You know, maybe you did have a front end impact, but maybe the right rear wheel hit a curb. Uh, maybe there was a, a keg of beer in the back that came fly, flying forward in the trunk and took the, the rear package tray in the back seat support and drove it forward. Uh, maybe they had a mocha and they've dumped it on the floor and it's already absorbed. Well, three days later, it's going to smell like yesterday's yogurt. You know, so you, know, you need to ask these questions. So as you're starting to build that repair plan, um, inquiring with the customer. Uh, if the car was driven in, uh, are, you, are you 
you know, smelling anything, are you, you have any new rattles, uh, you know, all sorts of things like that that are going to help you build that repair plan. And again, back to Toby's earlier discussion, we don't want that supplement. That supplement costs us a lot of money. So those questions in the beginning, yes, go ahead. Uh, okay. Well, a lot of good things to ask the customer also is for another good thing is you got electronics. You know, with all the cameras and back and that sort of thing, don't rely on the scan. <coughs> they say right up front. Now, once the customer puts all these things together, you'll instruct them to call back the insurance company and reposition the facts to loss. Otherwise, you'll be struggling with what's on your bill compared to what the customer claimed in the original facts to loss. Exactly. These cars are equipped with geo, you know, we're, we're now setting up with geo fencing. There's so much things happening. And by the way, none of this is an opinion of mine or Toby's or Ron's or anyone else of why we should walk around a car. By the way, this is straight from the uh, Nissan repair manual from the ESM stating, walk around the vehicle. So why do we do this? Because the manufacturer states it needs to be done. Not only that, it's a perfect opportunity to engage a customer and upsell for prior damage. And so you don't get blamed for it as well. Your image just need to document that. But it's a prime opportunity at that time uh, to explain to them, well, we're only going to have the tint, you know, the color match, so we can actually reduce slightly uh, the amount of cost possibly in doing that customer pay if you're doing it in sequence with the other repair. Okay, um, this here is a uh, vehicle, and we just looked at the, the visible damage. A lot of guys would just say, oh, the bumper, uh, hood, little damage to the fender. So if you look at the date I put this down, that was the date we this was done. <laughs> 10 years ago I wrote, did, this pro, did this vehicle. But this has got some things on there. Now, today we have computerized sheets and they have all that information. I walk into shops, I don't know, I see it all the time, I don't see a date in, and I don't see a target date. Why do you want a target date? Sir, why would you want a target date? Make sure you're out of the schedule. Okay. What else? Just communication. Communications? Yeah, I, know. I mean, if, if I don't have a date on there and I walk by, I don't know when that car was supposed to have promised out. It might have been promised out two days from now or a week from now. And if it's two days and we haven't even started on we got some real problems there, don't we? So here's my SOP that I made 10 years ago, and it says, Oh, this is just something I put together. It's on a sheet. Give it to all, everybody has that sheet. And there you go. Now, items needed in your teardown stall. I tell you, we took that one step further through your last one. Because it was getting a detailer, and my detailer was like, what did you do to the car? So now we mark on the opposite side what the detailer needs to look at the Okay, and how do you do that? This, right, and does he check it off? Yeah, just look, we yeah. look at right, right under the bumper. Very good. Because otherwise it gets them and it's like. So that is what you're, you're mapping the vehicle again. Yeah. Very good. Again, guys, exp you know, I always ask you to share your experiences because the best way to learn is from other shop owners. And you got to look at all the people. All of, we go from Hawaii all the way to New York or Massachusetts, wherever that gentleman was. And I don't know how we didn't have anybody from Texas, did we? No. Oh yeah, there we go. Now all the way up to we had somebody from uh, here, in Michigan. We have Hawaii. Hawaii, Big Island. Uh. So again, share your stuff. Yes, sir. I have one recommendation. <clears throat> We're very good about that, and, and, and what you have on your window is very good. One of the things that we used to have a lot of controversy is finger pointing. Um, and and one, of the, one of the dates that we put on our windows is in paint date. Because we've always had a tendency for the body techs to throw the paint shop under the bus. It gets, it gets in there the day before it's supposed to be delivered or two days before. And if you look on your repair plan, it'll say when, when that car should be in paint so that the painters have a fair opportunity to have a fair amount of time to, to do that repair process. And we just found that it caused a lot less controversy if the technicians knew when their drop dead in paint date needed to be so that we weren't throwing the paint shop under the bus. J just one thing that we That's did, it. I wanted to throw that do in. You use a, so, do you use a job sheet? Uh, yes, we do. 
And so, the, but the end pane gate, we like it to be real visual, visual for everybody, and then we use intercompany communication. I like that idea. It and and it's really idea. caused a lot less friction between the body and the paint department. Um, for our shop, you know, just, just, just to throw that I out think it there works. for you guys. But it's amazing how, as again, you guys, I'm in shops two, three, four, five a week, and I see it all, and nothing worse than a car sitting there, and they say, when's that car going out? Nobody knows. Oh, it was supposed to go out yesterday, and it's still sitting there. It hasn't been touched. You know, so it's part of the communication process. Uh, so these are some of the things that I would tell a shop to have in their uh, teardown area. Um, you don't want to have to go looking for stuff. Because if you have to go looking for it, what is it, sir? Very good. Thank you. I did, at least I got one point across. Pre-measuring for damage. Danny. So, again, when the car comes in, our eyes can't see everything wrong with a car. We haven't gotten those contacts yet. I'm working on that. But what we can do is we can start using the tools that we have available. And again, this isn't an opinion that I, I, I made. This isn't something that Ron or Toby made. This is something that the manufacturer states. After a collision, measure the vehicle. Check the structure. Why, did, why, are, why are reasons that we want to measure a vehicle and to ensure that's in the correct specs? What can, those system, what, can that, what can the structure of the vehicle do to affect other components of the vehicle beyond alignment of the body panels? Could the suspension be affected by a uh, damaged uh, unibody? Could the ADAS systems be affected if the suspension's out of alignment? How about, the, how about if the lower quarters get hit and those, uh, the BSM sensors are sitting at a one degree tilt? So what we want to do is measure the vehicle in advance so we know what we're working on. It's nice to be able to have a repair plan that no, and you know what it's going to take to fix that car. So when someone comes in and says, let's discuss it, let's get, the, uh, let's get authorization gone, going, you can submit your measuring report. You can say this frame is already off. It's already... It's out of specification. I need to pull it this way. I need to set it up this way. I need to use this type of frame equipment in order to do the repair. Because you may have to plan out the type of equipment you're using. Some of you may be using a universal system. Some of you are using a dedicated system. How about having that, the fixtures arrive on the right day when the car's ready to go? Can't, renting fixtures, again, it's a cost. Every day that car's sitting on there, you're generating a cost. Let me... Uh, uh, expand on this one a couple things here. How many of your technicians, a car got hit in the front 2017 vehicle and they'll put the four pinch well clamps on and then they'll just measure the front of the car? How do you know that the, with the movement of vehicles today with all these ultra high strength steels and that started in 2013, it is called, what kind of steel is it? It's ultra high strength steel. What do we know it as? No, it's called energy transfer. Where do we find it? And what is that stuff doing? Transfer energy. So you got a car hit in the front. How many guys have worked on a 2014 Honda Accord? Come on, very popular car. How many of you ever looked between the two A-pillars on the inside the engine compartment is a beam? And it goes between the two A-pillars. What do you think that's for? Everyone said, oh, to keep the engine from going inside the car. No. It is designed to keep the A-pillars from collapsing on a rollover. If you got hit on the left front, guess what? That right A-pillar will move. How do, you, how do you find it out? And I tell you this, no more eight points, ladies and gentlemen. Minimum 12. And that means the whole car. When you say you measure, you don't want to be brought into court and say, yeah, I measured the car. What'd you measure? Oh, the front damage. Well, how about the rear? So we have to change our mindset with the, today's cars and start to look at, if you're gonna measure that car, you measure front to rear, or rear to front, but make sure it, the whole car is measured. I suggest looking up, a, go, go, on, go online and look up a, a five, 10 mile an hour crash test. You'll see a nose car will go dive down, back end jumps up a little bit, and you see the rear wheels moving in and out. Something we can't see with our eyes, but when we see it in slow motion, it gives you a different perspective of what happens in, a, in an accident. Okay, this here is a teardown area at my friend's shop. Um, there's a cart there marked with a cart. He puts the RO number and all the information on it. Um, 
We put in a pair uh, seat, uh, seat savers and we put on floor mats. Again, why? First off, if the consumer walks in and sees their car and you're maintaining it, what do you think how they're going to feel that their repairs are? Remember that this is probably either their first or second most in, uh, in investment in their lives. I don't care what year it is, it's, to them is an investment. So again, so when we're walking around a car, we're going to be able to identify some additional things beyond how cool a car looks. We have to look beyond the grill. But indicators on the grill can, can show you that there might be a Distronic sensor, a really nice $3,000 piece of equipment behind that plastic grill. If you look on the Audi on the lower left corner, those aren't fog lights in the, in the, the black openings. That's literally $6,000 worth of adaptive cruise control sensors. Honda Civic, that's not a really big temperature sensor down there. That's another $800 distance sensor on a Honda Civic that may cost 10, 12, 15,000 base model. And again, with Infinities, that's not an air scoop for the cooling system. That's not a brake duct. That's an actual sensor down there. So we got to start identifying these things on our walk around and start capturing what's, be what's behind there. Everyone ran across a Lexus with a blue or a Lexus or Toyota with a grill with a blue type emblem, a $28 emblem. There's a reason why that emblem cost the, the, uh, the amount it does, because it was designed to read through uh, for the sensors to be able to pass through and read what's in front of it. It's really, I've seen it happen. The, uh, shop orders a part, they get the wrong part in, they figure out, they, they assume that they ordered it by VIN, they put it on there, they deliver the car and the customer says, my, my cruise control system doesn't work. I mean, who would have ever thought a grill could do that? Can, can it cause an effect? For, for example, on that Audi, anytime you just take off that bumper cover and put it back on, that's a recalibration, typically done by a dealer. After a four-wheel alignment after with a full tank of fuel and possibly 200 pounds of weight in the trunk. So. And, and, and the cost associated with that. And you can imagine, I was just talking to you earlier today, to do that calibration may require an alignment and all these operations. You may have to do the rear cameras. You might have to do the night vision camera in conjunction with it. So it's a domino effect. And where are you going to get that information from? YouTube. <laughs> exactly. OK. Ask somebody else. Moving along. How many of you estimators, blue printers, check all the lights before you start going? Now think about it. Well, you got a gentleman right there. He says checks them all. Is that part of your process? How many times in the course of a repair in a year's time you have to put in light bulbs and taillights and, and not get paid for it because you didn't catch it? Now, let's say you have that bulb in the back and, what's, and you call up the consumer and say, sir, your bulb in the back is damaged. What's your response? Right. So I need you to call your insurance carrier and tell them that your light bulb is out in the back. So some of these light bulbs are gets very expensive. You remember now, I'm going to bring this back up. Remember the $25 that we talked about that you leave off that estimate. How many times do you have to give that away before it just starts eating into your profits? All you had to do was check the lights. Yes, Danny. How many people have an inventory of light bulbs in their shop? I'd recommend start ordering those things from the dealer and manufacturer specific because those light bulbs are now becoming more and more sensitive to the electronics in the vehicle. It may fit, your, your bulb may fit in there, but what you don't know is what it's potentially doing to the other electronics because everything's regulated by voltage. It, it's so sensitive these days, the CAN bus systems. I mean, heck, if my uh, map light goes out, my car throws a, uh, light on, uh, a dash light on. So you have a da uh, light out. That's just from the map light in the interior. So these, these light bulbs are so sensitive, so it's really important to have it um, be the original bulb Thanks. and not just one that fits. And you don't want to find that bulb out yeah. when you're you know, 45 minutes away from delivering a $13,000 car on Friday night and it's vehicle specific. So if you've tested that and you've lined item that item on your, your repair plan, 
uh, then the parts department orders it in a timely manner along with all the other items and you know it becomes chargeable it's not like uh, an 1156 or 1157 bulb that you know you can buy you know a box of them from china for 67 cents so uh you know they're they're vehicle specific now and at danny's point the ohm resistance between brands is enough to throw a code mapping the vehicle ladies and gentlemen is a uh, good way to uh, help you write that sheet and it also is a good way of having your technicians know what you actually want um, Here's a, an SOP for marking, mapping the vehicle. Uh, it's real simple. Um, X is replace. I circle the area for repair. Uh, R and I with the arrows, and then I'll put a blend if it's down there. You know, this, this drives back to the 100% the uh, disassembly. Um, you're not going to know whether or not those belt molding clips are going to survive or not. Uh, whether or not there's a mylar film that needs to be removed from the vehicle and if some prior repair was done, and they mask it off and blend it over it, and then you have to remove it for your process. So, you know, the time to capture that, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, cleaning and retaping, molding, sometimes they, they end up curling up like a snail. Uh, very few people, I don't think, uh, clean and retape adhesive moldings anymore. But uh, all of these things need to, need to happen at the beginning of that repair process, so we're capturing all of those little nuisance items that keep us from delivering that car in a timely manner. Uh, and again, that $25 cost, uh, you know, what's, what's the supplement cost? So, what, as Danny alluded to before, walk around the car, what we noticed is that the uh, fender to door line is open at the top and closed at the bottom, which would indicate a sag condition. Everybody know what a sag condition is? Mm -hmm. That's a change in height. How many of you sit there on your estimates, and be honest, Put down pull and square body. Nobody? Well, one honest person. What do you guys, what do you put on yours? Well, we would break it down. And you break it down. down. So, again, ladies and gentlemen, you want to break it down to, first off, so the carriers know what you're doing and also what your technicians are. Here we took the bumper off. And a lot of times these guys will take their bumpers and just toss them over the top with everything on. Well, take a look what happened is that the uh, absorber on the backside had a big old crack in it. When are you going to find it? When you go to put the, take it apart the day that you're going to deliver the car? These things need to be completely torn apart. Again, when we looked at the lights on the fog lamps, turns out they you couldn't see them on the back, but the backside was broken. Again, you, you need to take them apart. So uh, this particular shop has a, a chart where all the parts are. So if an adjuster walks in, they say, where are the parts? It's on RO number one, two, three, four, and it's on the bottom shelf. Instead of going running around the place looking for them, wasting all that time. Um, here they're uh, actually looking for the clips and they're putting the clips in uh, at the time of blueprinting. How many of you guys sit there and check the Freon, the amount of Freon? in the system before you start working on it. One, two. How do you know what is in there? Pardon me? Well, you should find out how much you had in there. That stuff's pretty expensive, isn't it? So I would want to know. Here we had no, we had no Freon in the system and I did some research on the vehicle, and if you look right here, it was cracked. Now, if you waited till the end of the repairs, the bumper's all over that thing, you go put the Freon in, guess what? It's all going to leak out, and now you've got to find out where it is. They don't have that line in place. Guess what? More, you're paying rental. You've got an upset customer because they were going to take that vehicle out on the weekend. Now they can't go because you didn't check it all out. So we took the fender off. We, the fender uh, seal was damaged. As you can see, we marked an X on it. Um, we removed the fender clips. And the fender liner and the clips were broken. We now added the estimate. We took off the uh, grill, and a big old chunk of it fell apart. We're not going to glue it back together. We're going to get a new grill. And we found some other clips that were broken. I have a tram gauge in there, and this shows you that sway condition. So that would be in the file also, so I have a record of it. Ron, you want it? That's yours. 
Yes. Um, you know, structural repairs on um, new vehicles, uh, many vehicles uh, do not allow clamping at all. And without pulling your OE repair procedures, a lot of rocker panels are attached no longer with, with welding, but with weld bonding. And if you put that in a clamp and secure it, you've, you've, you've compromised that weld bond structure. So, you know, you need to know what's going on there. Uh, many new vehicles now, uh, you know, your, your pulling system is no longer going to be used by clamping. You're going to have a, either a universal or a dedicated fixture system, uh, and you need to know that. The only way you're going to know that is by analyzing those OV repair procedures at the beginning of your, your repair planning process. Uh, you know, it, and again, the, the, the first statement on here, it'll vary depending on the type of damage that the OE uh, might recommend a specific type of repair equipment. Mercedes-Benz, it's Solet or Carbench. That's the only two, you know, vehicle uh, that, uh, frame machines that they allow uh, for straightening. Uh, but there still may be some standard uh, standardization in, in clamping the vehicles, uh, but we're going to have to find that out first uh, before you do that, because going back, uh, we had a, a vehicle that uh, came from another shop and that they had clamped it and we had to replace both the inner and the outer rockers. Uh, their garage keeper's liability wrote a check for about $20,000. Yeah, you know, just for that, that's a pretty serious mistake. So, Some of those parts, of course, are, are going to be restricted um, depending off their structural uh, by the OEs today. Volkswagen just had a statement that came out three or four weeks ago. They're going to be restricting their A-pillars on their vehicles. And this is Golfs and Jettas. It isn't just the ultra, you know, high-end Volkswagen, you know, and that's, that's a, that's a, a run-of-the-mill vehicle in that respect. It's not a, it's not an Audi, it's not a Porsche. Um, so even these, uh, what I consider consumer-level vehicles, uh, we're starting to see parts restriction. And the methodology of putting them in, following the OB repair procedures, uh, as well as, you know, all the other things that get into that cavity waxing, corrosion protection, understanding the right welding equipment that you're using, uh, the, the uh, destructive tests. If you have three different welding systems uh, to put in a particular panel, and it's not, not uncommon at all. I think, Danny, you've got the, the estimate on uh, uh, the Nissan Altima. Yep. I think there were three different uh, uh, attaching methodologies. That's three welder setups. That's three weld destruction tests that all need to be documented in that process. Uh, again, so you know what you're doing, but get that ahead of time. Uh, you know, Honda Pacific uh, MIG brazing wire or Honda Pacific welding wire. Uh, back to Toby's point earlier, you've got that vehicle mounted on, on, a, on one of your, your, your frame machines and it's going to sit while you try to scramble and find that welding wire. Uh, it's just not efficient use of your time. Uh, go ahead. We're going to move on. Again, uh, just a couple, I'm going to go through this fairly quick because we want to get to our books. Um, you got a receiver dryer that needs to be sealed off. You want to prevent the desiccant inside there from attracting moisture. Some manufacturers will tell you that you open up the system, you need to replace it. Um, and when we pull the, the uh, radiator, the AC condenser out, we found damage on the radiator. Again, thorough teardowns. And that was the cart all finished up. Uh, let me just go through this real quick. Um, the DEG, how many people have heard of the DEG? Well, this is the gentleman that runs it, and he's the one who's going to help you out. If you don't know what it is, it is if you find something in the database that you don't think is right, you can request a, uh, him to look it up and deal with the information providers. But 97% of the time, we, it's always for the shop. It's for everyone. No, no. When but, oh, for, so right now we see we see about 50 to 60 percent change, like between CCC uh, S, um, uh, inquiries. 50 to 60 percent of the inquiries that come in get changed, typically because of a in incorrect information in there. So everyone, write this down: www.degweb.org. You know, back to Daniel's point, um, we all think that the time studies are done every time a, a, a model comes out. I think they're only time setting what two percent of the vehicles. So you know, when a new model comes out, uh, and I've sat in meetings with Mitchell and, and the other uh, IPs, they're they're actually looking at the physical length of a rocker panel and comparing it to some data that they may have uh, that's three, four, five years old. Uh, but you know, they don't take into consideration there might be sacrificial panels in relation to that. 
Um, so, you know, there's a lot of challenges. We do a lot of foreign cars, a lot of Audis and things like that. And in, in replacing a rocker panel, uh, you know, with not only with the welder setup, because there might be a combination of weld bond, riveting, as well as, as, as some mechanical welding, but, but all of those things that are, that are related to that. And you look at that time and you go, man, this just isn't working for us. And so by having your technician actually monitor his time and all the operations, and you submit that to Danny at the DEG, he's going to package that together and go to the IP and challenge them and say, you know, we're challenging this time and here's the, the reasons why we believe it's X. And we're very, very successful at getting times changed. How many times do you work on a car that's so new when you call the dealership for a part, they're scratching their heads on that car? Like how the hell did it get into your shop already? Give it to a customer, they'll wreck anything. <laughs> okay. Um, we, we have a workbook. Um, I put together for you people. It's yours to take back. If you don't need one between two of you, please let us know, because we only have 59 of them. What I want you to do, don't open them yet, because you're in for a surprise. I want you all to be surprised at the same time. 